Well, hello there, Mississippi. I hope and pray that you and your family are well during this unusual time that we find ourselves in in our nation's history. Well, unless you've been hiding under a rock or in the back of a cave, you are aware that we have an election coming up in November. Now, I'm not here to talk about any particular candidate or party affiliation, but rather the three ballot measures that all Mississippians will be faced with on November 3rd when they go in to vote. They say that knowledge is power, and I want you to have the power to make an informed decision because it not only affects you, but it affects your family, your neighbors, and our great state of Mississippi. So I hope that you'll share this video with everyone you know, post it on social media, reach out to me if you have any other questions, and that you will like my page so that I can keep you informed in the future about issues that face our state as well as legislation that may be coming down the pipe. So without any further ado, let's dig right in. There are three ballot measures on the ballot that each voter in Mississippi will be confronted with this November. I wanna skip over the first ballot measure because we're going to spend a lot more time on it at the end of this video and go straight to ballot measure two. Now ballot measure two has to do with how we elect our statewide officials. Now for a candidate currently to win a statewide race, they must win not only the majority of the vote, but they must also win the majority of the House districts, the 122 House districts in the state. Now, this ballot measure seeks to strike that language and move our state to purely the popular vote. That means that for, in order for somebody to win an election statewide, they must garner the majority, 50% plus one, of the popular vote. Now, the current system is somewhat akin to the electoral college system that we enjoy as a nation when it comes to electing our president. The new measure seeks to strike the language where the House would be the ones that determined and put it purely to the popular vote. Now, what would happen in the case of, say, you had three or four candidates, maybe one was a libertarian, one was an independent. If nobody garnered the majority of the popular vote, there would be a runoff until somebody did. Now, this has only happened once. The Mississippi House of Representatives has decided a gubernatorial election one time. In 1999, Ronnie Musgrove, a Democrat, received a plurality of the vote, 8,300 more votes than the next highest vote getter, Mike Parker, the Republican in the contest, with four candidates total. Musgrove received 49.6% of the vote, while Parker received 48.5% of the vote. Musgrove and Parker each won 61 of the state's 122 House districts. Since neither candidate won a majority, over 50%, of the vote, and neither candidate won a majority of the state's House districts, the Democratic-controlled Mississippi House of Representatives decided the election. The House chose Musgrove on January 4, 2000, in a vote of 86 to 36 along party lines. So you're probably asking yourself, why are we addressing this now? It's been 130 years that we've operated under this system and only once has the House of Representatives determined the outcome of the race. Well, if you'll remember in 2019, we had a hotly contested race between Jim Hood and Tate Reeves. There was a lot of debate on whether or not somebody might win the popular vote, but lose the House district. Back then, in 2019, Eric Holder, the former attorney general that served under Obama, sued the state of Mississippi. He made accusations that this process was discriminatory. And so it comes before you now. So you have simply an up or down decision on this ballot measure. Up being, yes, you want to change it to the popular vote, that it would be the popular vote that would determine our statewide races. Or no, you like the way that we do it and have done it. Ballot measure three has to do with choosing a new flag to represent our state going forward. Now this particular ballot measure is not without plenty of controversy, heated debate, and emotion. In fact, in my five years of government service, I have never received the amount of phone calls, text messages, and emails that I did on this one subject almost 6,000 emails in the month of June alone. So how did we get here? 
Well, back in the month of June, the legislature voted to suspend the rules, which allowed them to bring forth a measure to retire the 1894 flag. That is the flag that has flown over our state since 1894. In that measure, it laid out certain parameters that had to be followed for any new flag that would represent our state. One, it could not contain the Confederate battle cross. And two, it must contain the words, in God we trust. It also set up a commission by which people could submit their submissions and designs and drawings for a new state flag. And over the course of the summer, they received over 3,000 different submissions. They narrowed it down to one, and this is what you have before you on the ballot. So the question you are faced with is this. Yes, you think this is the flag that should represent our state and you like it, or no, you don't like the flag and you want them to go back to the drawing board. Now, if the no's win, they will go back and provide us with a new choice next year during the municipal election. Now, your voting no on this does not mean that we will return to the 1894 flag. Now, let's return to ballot measure one. Ballot measure one has to do with whether or not Mississippi should have a medical marijuana program or not. If you are against Mississippi having a medical marijuana program, you need only circle the bubble that says against both initiative measure number 65 and alternative measure number 65A. I wanna thank you for watching this video, if that is you, and encourage you to share it with everyone you know, as well as like my page so that I can keep you informed. And you can turn the video off right now. Thank you for watching. But if you do want a medical marijuana program, you are going to be confronted with whether or not to vote for initiative 65 or initiative 65A. And that's what we are going to dive into now. Now, if you are for a medical marijuana program in our state, then this becomes a two-part ballot. You must vote for the approval of either in the first portion, and then vote in the second portion for either Initiative Measure 65 or Alternative Measure 65A. Now, if you vote for the approval of either, but fail to vote for one or the other, 65 or 65A, your vote will be invalid and will not be counted. Now, in order for a marijuana program to pass in our state, it must not only garner the majority of the votes, but the total majority must be at least 40% of the total votes cast in the election. So how did we get here? Well, Mississippi has a process in place where you or I or a group of individuals can get a measure placed on the ballot for a statewide referendum. Now, you must go through the Secretary of State's office, you must file the proper paperwork, and then you must collect a requisite amount of signatures. Uh, currently, I believe it's about 106,000 plus signatures, and they must be certified voters within our state. They must also have a certain amount from each one of our congressional districts. If you're successful in doing that and paying your fee and getting it filed, it will go on the ballot for a statewide referendum. And that is exactly what the folks behind Initiative 65 did. Now, I reached out to Jamie Grantham, the director of Mississippians for Compassionate Care, since they were the ones that got the ball rolling on this issue, and asked if she would produce me a short video talking about their ballot measure. Hi, I'm Jamie Grantham with Mississippians for Compassionate Care. I'm here to talk about the differences in the two measures for medical marijuana on the November 3rd ballot. Initiative 65 was placed on the ballot by more than 228,000 Mississippians who want medical marijuana as an option for patients who are suffering. 65 would give this option to qualified patients with debilitating medical conditions, including cancer, epilepsy, ALS, PTSD, chronic pain, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, and others. 65 was thoroughly researched and carefully written. Physicians decided the list of 22 debilitating medical conditions 
organizations. 65 includes a framework for how the program would function based on the best practices for medical marijuana programs in other conservative states that are functioning well. It includes a program start date, a specific list of qualified medical conditions, protection for patients, caregivers, and doctors, strict regulation, and it is self-funded. It will not fall on taxpayers' shoulders. 65 also includes zoning limits and legal protection for employers, schools, and property owners. The other option on the ballot is Alternative 65A. 65A was placed on the ballot by the legislature after 65 qualified to confuse voters and dilute the vote so that neither measure passes. The legislature could have long ago passed a medical marijuana program if they truly wanted to help patients, but they've not done that. Instead, over the last decade alone, they've actually blocked every proposed bill to pass a medical marijuana program legislatively. More than 20 proposed bills have been blocked. Not one of those made it to the floor for a vote. Their alternative, 65A, has zero guarantees or accountability. There's no start date or framework for how the program would function. It does not even have a list of qualifying medical conditions. It leaves it to politicians, not doctors, to decide who would qualify. It doesn't include zoning limits for medical marijuana businesses or protection for property owners, schools, and employers. It does not even include a caregiver clause, which means that minors with debilitating conditions and homebound and elderly patients would not get to participate. It doesn't even provide constitutional protection for patients, caregivers, or doctors. It fails to include every basic fundamental component necessary to establish a medical marijuana program that would truly help patients. And 65A would be on taxpayers' shoulders to fund the entire program. 81% of Mississippians want a medical marijuana program as an option for patients who are suffering. 34 other states have regulated medical marijuana programs, and more than 3.5 million patients are receiving relief. It is safe and effective in treating pain, nausea caused by chemotherapy, seizures, tremors, and other debilitating symptoms. And no one has ever died from medical marijuana, but people are dying every day from opioids. Mississippians who want a safe, effective, and immediate medical marijuana program should vote yes for Initiative 65 on November 3rd. And be sure to answer both questions on the ballot. When the legislature added 65A, they changed the ballot from a simple yes or no question of should Mississippians with qualifying debilitating medical conditions have access to medical marijuana under the care of their physicians to a confusing two-part question. Voters must vote on both questions. This is what the sample ballot will look like. You must first vote for the approval of either measure and then choose Initiative 65. For more information and to see the full comparison chart of the two measures, please go to medicalmarijuana2020.com and follow us on social media. Share information. Make sure you are informed and help spread the word to friends and family to vote for Initiative 65, not the politician's 65A. So what is the real difference between 65 and 65A? Well, 65 and 65A both amend the Mississippi Constitution. 65 is already defined and written, and it would go into the Constitution as written. I would encourage you to read that particular initiative so that you will know what all it includes. 65A would put it purely in the hands of the legislature to decide what the program would look like, how it would be administered and taxed, and, and facilitated. So the real question here is if you want a medical marijuana program in our state is whether or not to put it in as presented in Initiative 65 or to give the power to define that system and monitor and maintain it going forward to the legislature. Now as you can imagine there are a lot of pros and cons offered from both sides that have to do with both ballot measures. So what I've done is I've included a few videos, I've embedded them into this video for you to watch and do a deeper dive. I think you need to be educated on both sides because if you don't know all the arguments, then you probably aren't going to be that informed going forward. And this is a big step for our state. It has plenty of ramifications. It will help people and it may hurt people, but it would be good for you to dig in a little deeper and make a decision on your own. I want you to be informed and I want you to share this video with everyone you can think of so that they can be informed as well. 
And I also hope that you will get out and vote. Get your friends, get your family, get everyone you know out to the polls on November 3rd because it's not just a right, but a privilege that we get to go to the polls in our nation and in our state and to vote. So many good men and women have died to grant us that privilege. So I hope this video has been helpful and I hope you'll reach out to me if you have any questions and that you'll like my page so that I can keep you informed on upcoming issues. God bless you.